in Matthew's account of the Sermon on the Mount, you remember there's a section in there about how Jesus is showing people that God takes care of us and loves us and he, he says, you know, take the example of the birds. You know, they don't uh, plant or, or store up in barns, but God's take, God takes care of them. And then he talks about the lilies of the field how God uh, takes care of them and, and how uh, He's concerned about His creation, showing the people that God loves them uh, very much. I was just reading this week another example that fits in very well, and, and I, I hope you can follow this example along because it's a great example of how God even cares about the tiniest parts of His creation. I don't know if you're from your school days reading about amoebas, They're t tiny, tiny single-celled organisms, extremely tiny, and, and you could put a huge number of them on the head of a pen. You know, you have to have m strong microscopes to see them. And these organisms, they, they multiply by splitting in two. They, they just divide in two. Well, on occasion, one of them has trouble dividing. In other words, they, they start to divide, but they can't finish the process. And you know what happens? Some of the other amoebas notice that this one amoeba can't divide by itself, so they go over there and help it split. When I read that, I thought that was one of the most amazing things in the world. This is a tiny, single-cell organism doesn't have a brain, central nervous system, nothing like that. And yet God designed it so that amoebas would almost act like midwives and help the one amoeba who was having a hard time multiplying to finish the process. They would actually go over as a group and help the amoeba split. Now, obviously, there's no way in the world that happened by chance. God loved His creation enough to actually design it so that even something as tiny and simple as an amoeba would help other amoebas. So if God was concerned that much about amoebas, He's concerned about us. And you know how much He's concerned about us? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That's how much He cares for us. I found that to be amazing, uh, it, just amazing, and I hope you do too, because this world and its creation is an amazing world, because that's the God we serve. Last week, we kind of started a series of lessons about how we can make this congregation better. We talked about, you know, what I can do to ensure that there's a congregation here in five years, ten years, twenty years, and how important that is. This morning's lesson, the second of three, is going to focus on what you can do personally to make this congregation better. And, and there's a list of things, kind of at the beginning, it's going to be rather broad, and then we're going to narrow it down, even to our Hope you won't start thinking I'm getting to the point where I'm meddling. But we were going to talk about how we can improve attitudes to make the congregation better. So what can we do? Well, the first thing, of course, and probably the most important is, can you love more? Now, just think about it. Now, if you can't, okay, say, I can't love anymore. Then I already do. But can you really love God more? You know, in, in Matthew 22, we have the account of, uh, of the one asking Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And his response was what? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and mind. Heart, soul, and mind. Now, when you look at those three ways of, of loving, can you love the Lord your God more than you do right now with your heart? Can you love Him more with your soul? And can you love Him more with your mind? 
Can you? Or have you reached a limit? Can you love Christ more than you do right now? Is there any way that you can love Christ more than you do? In John chapter 14, we have these words that should stick with us. John chapter 14 and verse 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. What does he say? If anyone loves me, they will keep my word. So can we keep God's word more? Can we do that? Because that's showing that we love God. Can we do that more? Keep his word more? The Bible tells us to love the truth because it's what saves. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. The truth saves. So can I love the truth more than I do right now? Can, can you love the truth more than you do right now? Because if you do, it will make this congregation a better place. Can you? Or, or do you love it as much as you possibly can already? See, these are personalized questions. Not ones for your neighbor or anyone else, but for you. Can you love God's Word more than you do right now? Is it possible? Because if you can love it more, the congregation will be a better congregation. Can I love and can you love each other more than you do? You know, the second part of that greatest commandment after he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and then he says what? Love your neighbor as yourself. So love everyone else as you love yourself. Are you loving others the very most you can? Have you reached the limit? Can you love any more than you do right now? Is it possible? Because if you can love each other more, then this will be a better congregation. Can you give more? This was the meddling part. Can you give more? And just think about how much you give. And I'm not just talking about what you give on Sunday morning. That, that's, that's certainly part of giving, but that's not the entirety of giving. Can you give more of your time? Is, is it possible or are you at your maximum? And if you are, that's great. But can you give more of your time than you do right now? The abilities, the talents that God has given you, can you use them any more than you are right now? Now think about what you're able to do. Think about the abilities you have, whatever they are. And you may think they're pretty small, but there's nothing small in God's sight. So is there any way you can use those talents and abilities more than you are now? Because if you can, this will be a better congregation. What if your ability is writing letters? That's a great talent. You know, some people can't write letters. They really can't. But if that's something you can do, can you write more letters than you are right now? Some people have a great talent of calling and talking with people. Can you call and talk more than you do now or have you reached your limit? And maybe you have reached your limit. But can you do more calling and talking? Can you give more of the resources you have? Can you give more of your money? Or, or are you giving as much as you reasonably can give? Maybe you are. But those will make a better congregation. You know, we studied 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9 in our Sunday morning class a few weeks ago. And of course, that section's on giving. And Paul was, was concerned that the church in Corinth wouldn't live up to their responsibilities. So he said, look at these uh, people in Macedonia. They're in deep poverty, but yet 
they're giving greatly. And in the ninth chapter, I think it's around verse 5, he says the reason for that is they gave of themselves first. They gave of themselves first. Are you giving all of yourself that you can give? Because if you can give more, it will make the congregation a better congregation. So can you do that? Are you a cheerful giver? Are you a generous giver? Are you a, a voluntary giver? What can you do? Can you give more? So can you love more? Can you give more? What about can you worship and assemble more than you do? Can you? Can you worship? Can you assemble more of the saints than you do? Or are you doing as much as you can? Sometimes one, once a week is all you're able to do. And there are many in, in that position. And that's all they can do. But if you can assemble more, will you do that? Because it will make the congregation a better congregation if you're here. So can you do that? Remember David's attitude? Psalm 122 verse 1. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. See, that was his attitude. He loved that. He wanted to do that. So, is that our attitude? And is that what we really want to do? Are we glad when they say, we're going to meet here at this time? Are we glad when they say, we're going to worship or we're going to study God's Word at this time? Does that make you feel glad? Are you doing as much as you can? If you are, that's great. And God loves it. But can you do more? Can you worship more? Can we be like those early disciples? Turn with me right after the church was started. Acts chapter 2. And I'm not talking about what's the, what's the least I can do or, or what, what little commands can I follow. No, I'm talking about how much can you do, not how little you can do. Acts chapter 2, <clears throat> begin in verse 41. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly. That's an interesting word, isn't it? They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. He says in verse 46, So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. That's what he says. See how glad they were? So can I worship more? Can I assemble more? Can I fellowship more? Can I be a part of us more? Or are we doing all that we can? And maybe we're doing all that we can. And of course, God knows that and is thankful for that. Because all of us have uh, different, uh, different uh, amounts of health and different, uh, uh, you know, different issues like that. But the question is, are we doing what we can? Because if we can do more, it will make the congregation a better congregation. And that's what you and I want, I'm sure, is to make it a better congregation. Now, number four, 
can I work more or am I doing all that I can? And maybe you're doing all that you can and that's great if you are. The book of Titus talks about work. Titus chapter 2, and let's begin in verse 14. Titus chapter 2, verse 14. This is talking about what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. Notice verse 14. Who gave himself for us. This is what Christ has done. He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people. Now notice that last phrase. Are you looking at that last phrase? The last phrase says zealous for good works. Zealous for good works. What did He do for us? He set us apart as His own special people to do what? To be zealous for good works. So, am I working like God wants me to work? And that's a very broad term. Am I working like God wants me to work? Notice chapter 3 of Titus, verse 14. There he writes, And let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. So are we meeting urgent needs? Are we maintaining good works? Or do I need to really do more? Do I really need to do more? Can I do more? Is it possible to do more? And what about my study habits? Have I gone too far yet? You can shake your head yes if you want to. What about our study habits? Can I study more? Can I study more? Some of us might be using all the time that, that we really can to study and, and God appreciates that and loves that. Notice what he says, though, about the importance of that. How critical it is. 2 Timothy 2.15. I know you've heard this verse many, many, many times throughout your lives. He says in verse 15 of 2 Timothy, Be diligent. Make a great effort to present yourself approved to God. How do I do that? A worker who does not need to be ashamed. How do I do that? By rightly dividing the word of truth. It says that's how you accomplish that. So if I want to present myself or prove to God, if I want to be a worker who does not need to be ashamed, I have to rightly divide the word of truth. So, it's imperative that I know the truth, that I study the word of truth. So can I really study more? When people come to you with a question about, about what does it mean to be a Christian and why do you do this and that and, and why do you assemble on the Lord's Day and what's the Lord's Supper about and, and what, what is heaven and hell about? Are you able to give an answer to everyone who asks you of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear? 1 Peter 3.15 See, that's what He wants us to be able to do. Remember? When Peter wrote that letter, he wasn't writing just to elders or preachers or deacons. He was writing, if you go back to the very beginning of that letter, to the Christians who had been dispersed all over the area. So he says, be ready to do that. Well, it doesn't come by accident. We don't have that miraculously done for us. So can you really study more? Can you really study more? And now, some ways for improving attitudes. Some of these may, may apply to you, some of them may not. Number one, tell yourself over and over that since you were not perfect, you would not fit into a perfect congregation if one existed. Tell yourself that. You're not perfect, so you wouldn't want to be in a perfect congregation. 
you'd stand out like a sore thumb. Number two, instead of picking out the worldly members to point to, pick out the sincere, dedicated spiritual members and thank God for them. Let's do that. Let's have the attitude of, uh, of looking and seeing the, the dedicated spiritual members and let's thank God for every single one of them. That's a great attitude to, uh, to work on having. And it'll make the congregation here better if you do that, I guarantee it. If you're older, treat the young with the consideration you desired as a young person. And if you're young, treat adults with the respect you'll want when you're mature. Can we do that? Sure we can. When you're tempted to criticize others, be sure to pray earnestly for them first. This may not change them, but it'll do wonders for you. Can you do that? When you see a work neglected, instead of being critical, offer to him. We're not making enough phone calls. We're not visiting enough. Well, don't say we're, we're doing those things. Do something about it. So, so take that upon yourselves to do. Never, never blame others for your failure. Every individual can be faithful to God in spite of bad examples, discouraging attitudes, hypocritical acts of others. So, if you want to be, you can be. If you want to be faithful to God, you can be faithful to God. There's not a power on earth, including Satan, the Bible says, that can keep you from being faithful. There's nothing that has enough power to keep you from being faithful. It's all up to you. Remind yourself every day that the only way you can improve the world or the church is to begin with yourself. Begin with yourself. Consciously look for the good in every brother and sister and make a mental note of those good points. Every church has problems. Constantly ask yourself, am I a part of the problem or am I a part of the solution? You know, you're either one or the other, right? You're either part of the problem, you know, you're either making things worse or you're making things better. There's no way you can be somewhere in the middle. You're either doing one or you're doing the other. So a better congregation does start with us. It starts with you. It starts with you and, and the person next to you and the person next to you and so forth. Can you love more? Can you worship more? Can you study more? Can you work more? If you can, then let's do. Because if we want this congregation to be a better congregation, we want this congregation to be a faithful congregation, and we want this congregation to be here in the future, then all of us owe it to ourselves and our children, our grandchildren, the future of this church, we owe it to them to do that. So the future does depend upon you, and it depends upon what you do now. Not what you plan on doing, but it depends upon what you do now. So it's examine yourself. It's examine your, your thinking, it's examining your attitude, it's examining your talents, it's examining what you're doing, it's examining uh, your love, it's examining your priorities. And can you do anything to make this congregation a better congregation? Because there's always room for improvement. Because there's no perfect congregation. I hope you take these things to heart and I hope you think about these things not just in the next few minutes but in the days ahead and continue to ask yourself those questions and see if you can help make this congregation a better congregation. You know, the Lord invites you to make the congregation a better congregation, to, to be a part of this congregation. By accepting the truths of God's Word, 
believing on Christ, repenting and confessing, and then being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. He invites you to do that. He invites those who are in the body of Christ. If they've not been faithful, if they've not been loving like they should or giving like they should or, or working or studying like they should, to confess those wrongs publicly and ask for forgiveness. And maybe that's what you need to do this morning. But if you need to do any of those, we encourage you to come as we stand and sing this song.